So, welcome back. We are going to start the, the deep learning and NLP session in extreme classification. So, we have the pleasure to welcome uh, Pascal, who will be talking about uh, training neural network in time independent of output layer size. All stuff about uh, spherical family. So, thank you, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me for this workshop. Uh, so what I'm going to present is, uh, of course, joint work with my uh, PhD students, um, mostly Alexandre de Brévisson, uh, who did uh, a lot of the heavy lifting work uh, in this, what I'm going to show, and uh, Xavier Boutillier, who did some of the earlier work. Um, <clears throat> so to introduce the problem, let's consider a uh, usual neural network of type MLP, and uh, with some input, that could be large, and some target that we're going to suppose large but sparse. So uh, the input layer gets mapped to a hidden unit, a second hidden unit, a third hidden unit, and when we deal with uh, large output spaces, uh, extreme classification, or language models, here what we typically have is a very large output layer. Okay? So there's two dimensions here to take care of. There is the small d, which is going to be our last in layer, and big D, which is the output. So if we're to do, for example, a, a language model, then big D would be the size of the vocabulary for a word language model. And our target would be considered as a sparse vector. Okay. So now we have a loss. <coughs> for now, we'll consider uh, just a squared error loss. Um, much of my talk will be uh, trying to change that. I know it's not the usual loss in this type of models either, but let's start with a, with a squared error loss. Okay. So the problem in this <coughs> is that for the pull forward propagation, um, we have here a multiplication by a potentially very large matrix if the input is very large. But if the input is sparse, instead of doing this in O of big D times small d, which would be very computationally intensive, uh, we can do it in O of k d, where k is the sparsity of uh, our input. Okay? But if we look at what happens at the output layer, okay, um, there we have this big, big d times small d for computing this large output. Okay? Um, and similarly, when we do the backpropagation, even though our target is sparse, this doesn't help this doesn't help if we do the normal backpropagation, computing the gradient uh, with uh, respect to uh, update of W is big D times small d, and uh, backpropagating the gradient to H is big D times small d also. Okay? So these are prohibitively expensive if D is very large. The other operations are cheap, including backpropagating the input. Okay? So altogether, it's three times big D times small d. Okay. So, uh, what I showed uh, already at NIPS uh, last year is that for linear output and squared error, it's possible to do much better than big D times small d. Okay? Uh, the gradient with respect to the last hidden layer, the exact same update to W, and the loss can all be computed in O of small d squared without ever computing the full output O. That's what's uh, interesting. So it's independent of big D. So we can have extremely large layer the time is independent of it, okay? And the algorithm involves a factorized representation of W. So um, these are experiments that I showed last year, <coughs> basically what we had there, um, where you can see as the function of the size of the vocabulary here, this is in log log space, the timing in second of a mini batch of size 128, okay, for the out last output layer for doing a gradient update on it and um, different implementations. So there's a naive normal uh, gradient or version uh, on CPU and GPU and our factorized versions, okay? And we also use a hierarchical softmax, which is computes something different, but just for comparison. And what, what we can see is that, um, of course, all the, uh, un the uh, unfactorized, I mean, the naive versions uh, scale linearly with the size of the vocabulary Whereas our version here, you can see the um, CPU version here in green 
and the um, uh, GPU version here in green, they're constant. So with the size of vocabulary, they don't change. Okay. So here we can gain gain very large speed ups of uh, close to and uh, compared to the naive naive CPU version, we got almost um, I mean three three orders of magnitude speed up. Okay, so that, that's what we had uh, last year. Um, now, <coughs> in, and, and this work focused mainly on uh, linear output and squared error. Now, the approach can be extended to slightly broader family of uh, loss functions, um, a family that I call the spherical loss family. And here, by loss, what I mean is maybe a little different from what is usually thought of as loss. It's really everything that comes after the linear output preactivation. So uh, let's formally define this fabrical loss family. So suppose we have this O, which is our WH, so H is the last hidden re representation, and O, so the linear output, okay? And Y, our sparse target vector. So both O and Y are supposed to have dimension D, but Y is sparse. So K is the set of indices where Y is non-zero, okay? Um, and then we define the spherical loss family as any loss that can be expressed in the following way, so loss of O and Y, okay, as a function of uh, the sum of O squared, or the norm of O squared, the sum of the O's, okay, of all our outputs, the set of sparse indices, and the output computed but only at the sparse indices, and our target value at those sparse indices. Okay? So that's the spherical loss family. So an example, um, oh yeah, uh, this sum of O squared here, we'll call it Q, and this sum of O, we'll call it S, okay? So our loss is basically a function of Q, S, the K indices, and the outputs at those indices. So for example, if we uh, look back at our, our mean squared error loss, it's really the sum of squared difference between O and Y. And um, we can decompose this as sum of O squared minus 2OKYK plus sum of YK squared. So we can see this is Q. Okay. This is a dot product between O taken at the K sparse indices and Y taken at the K sparse indices because all the, all other terms will be zero, and this is just the norm squared of the Y at the K sparse indices because all other terms will be zero here. Okay. So this is just to show that the squared error forms comes into our spherical loss family definition. Okay. Now for classification problems. Uh, if C is the true target, we'll actually have our, our sparse index set K, which will just be the singleton C, okay? It's just a single. And uh, Y will be a, a one-hot vector, so only the, the Cth element of Y will be one, all, all the zero, and the Cth element of O will be OC, which is all we'll have in OK, okay? So the loss can be expressed as L of OC, which is L of Q, S, S, C, and OC. Okay. So these are two scalars. This is uh, a scalar also. Right. <clears throat> okay, so I won't explain in detail the, the algorithm uh, to, to compute uh, the uh, gradient update in O of D squared. I'll just give the gist of it, because the algorithm is they're complicated. So basically, there's two tricks that, that are being used. And they're the same as that we use for the, for the squared error. Uh, here's the just generalized. So uh, one trick is that you can compute the loss without computing all of O. Okay? So <clears throat> the first trick to be able to do that is we need to keep up to date a matrix Q, which is a small d times small d matrix and W bar, which is a small d vector, okay? And this allows efficient computation of Q, which is a norm O square. Normally, it would be computing the output, which is WH, which would take us O big D times small d, okay? But we can rewrite it this way. 
which involves just the matrix Q, which is a D squared matrix. And similarly for the sum, normally we would have to compute output O, okay? But instead we can just do this dot product with a W vector, okay? So once we have these, oops, sorry, uh, it remains to just compute the output at the K sparse locations, and we're done. Okay. So that's first trick, uh, which allows us to compute the, the, the loss in O of D squared. Now, if we look at the update of W, and that's where that's most striking, if we have our loss here, the gradient with respect to O will generally, generally not be sparse, okay? So if we look at the normal update of W, the normal gradient update, it would be updating W as a learning rate times uh, the gradient of L with respect to O, which is a non-sparse big D vector, um, and with the outer product with H, which is a small d vector, okay? So that's O of big D times small d, and that's going to touch all elements of W, okay? So it's very expensive. So the trick number two is we're not going to do that, we're instead going to use, to represent W implicitly as uh, this factorization of V times U plus uh, a unit 1D vector times our omega. <clears throat> and so um, we don't have fewer parameters, okay? It's not a factorization in the sense that we have fewer parameters. V has the same number of parameters as W. It has the same size. It's just that by representing W this way, we will be able to update V, U, and omega instead of W, but in such a way that the update is equivalent to, w, to the update of W, to this one, okay? But what the gain here is that we have to update only K rows of V, okay? So if we update only K rows of V instead of updating all big D rows of V here, okay, there's a big gain here, that is, we can get, compute the exact same gradient in O of small d squared instead of big D times small d. Um, and that update is different than if we were to do normal gradient descent on those. All right, that's important. If, we were, if you just uh, represent your network this way and do normal gradient descent, you haven't gained anything in terms of computation. So it's a different, it's kind of more involved. Okay. <clears throat> so. Now that uh, we've said <coughs> that we can use the spherical family uh, for, for this, whoops, sorry. Uh, let's explore the spherical family. What kinds of losses is it possible to use in that family? It's a restricted family. So now the log softmax is not in that family, unfortunately. So uh, we can try and search for alternatives to the log, log softmax for, cla for extreme classification problems. So one obvious thing that we can try is to do linear plus squared error, which we already had, but that's probably not the best suited for classification. It's a regression loss. Um, another approach that we tried was uh, to use a, a spherical loss to bound the log softmax. Okay, and here's a, a formula for the for log softmax to, to have a, an upper bound on the negative log softmax uh, that we minimize. But this didn't work very well, uh, I believe because the quadratic bound was too loose. Uh, so the two things that I'm going to focus on is uh, alternative categorical distribution formulations in the spherical family that are kind of similar to the softmax. So here we'll talk about the spherical softmax and the Taylor softmax. And alternative non-probabilistic loss that we call the, let, the Z loss. Okay. So categorical distribution. If we take our output O and look at what the softmax does. The softmax, what it does, it just takes the exponential of uh, every value in O, in our linear output O, and uh, normalizes it by dividing by the sum, okay? So the result is that uh, they're all positive and sum to one. And we're happy, they're probabilities, okay? And we take the log of that, and that gives us all loss, okay? Um, so here we can't use the exponential because the softmax here due to the exponential is not in a spherical family, but we can use squaring instead. So uh, we have two versions. Uh, one, the first one we developed was actually the spherical softmax, which is simply instead of doing exponential of O, we do a squaring of O, okay? And normalized by the sum, 
Okay, epsilon is for stability here. So again, this has the property of being positive in summing to one and being amendable by probabilities. Okay. And the other version that we use was we call Taylor softmax because it, it comes from a, a Taylor expansion of the exponential on the numerator and uh, the no denominator. Okay. And both of these are in the spherical family. We can express them in the canonical form uh, as functions of Q and S and are interpretable as yielding probabilities. Okay, so uh, what did these experiments yield <coughs> with these losses, the spherical softmax and the Taylor softmax? Well, on MNIST and CIFAR-10, they work quite well, uh, surprisingly. Uh, actually, <coughs> they yielded a better negative log likelihood than uh, when using the normal softmax, okay, and a better error rate. So that's surprising, but that's what we found. Um, now, unfortunately, on uh, CIFAR 100 and Pentry Bank, which have larger number of classes, 100 for CIFAR 100 and 10,000 for Pentry Bank, uh, these results were not as good. So the log Taylor softmax didn't do as well as the softmax in terms of negative log likelihood or in terms of error rate on CIFAR 100, uh, although it's reasonable, um, <clears throat> and in terms of perplexity also, uh, we were not able to match the log softmax. Actually, we tried to get as close as we could, and to do that, uh, we had to increase the number of neurons of the hidden layer. Okay. Uh, and our Simlex 999 scores were good, but for what, what, what that is worth. So it seemed it didn't, didn't work as well for large number of classes. And that's a problem because the whole point of this is really to ad adapt to, to apply to a large number of classes, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't bother. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, um, so this led us to another approach. Um, and we wanted to free ourselves from the necessity of having probabilities. Okay. So here, a little intuition. If we consider our uh, output here, our linear output, as a vector of scores, okay? Basically, wh. Well, we what we can see is w has number of rows, okay, of the same dimension as h, and w, and this is doing a dot product. I mean, each neuron here in the output is doing a dot product here between the first row and h, which may fall here, the second row and h, which may fall here, and if our target class is two, well, this is going to be the score for the second uh, class. Okay, for the target class, uh, three way fall here, four here, six here, etc. Okay, so uh, one thing to notice: so this is a linear, just a linear um, scores. The softmax won't change the rank, okay, because exponential is monotonous increasing. And um, in many cases, what we really care about is that the target class uh, has a higher ranking score. Okay, basically this class here, which is target two, we want to push it up. So this suggests using rank-based performance metrics, such as the top K or precision at K, which is the same thing. And uh, I also want to point out that there are many other non-probabilistic losses that work pretty well and known to work very well. For example, the uh, hinge loss of support vector machines, okay? That doesn't yield probabilities directly. So hence the idea, can we try to design one uh, loss function that would have the property of pushing up the target class uh, in the spherical family. Okay. So here I just, just want to, to point out, I put a little zero and a little one here. It's just to show that if we use squared error, okay, squared error, what it's going to do in a case like this, is going to try to move this point towards one and all the blue points towards zero. Okay. So that's what squared error is going to do. Okay. So if we look at this non-probabilistic loss possibilities, here's the, the non-probabilistic loss that we came up with, the Z loss, and it involves two steps. The first is to normalize the D linear output. So we have our D scores in O, okay? And we're going to take the mean of those scores, the average, I should say, and, <coughs> and uh, their empirical variance, 
or empirical standard deviation sigma and just standardize them. Okay. So basically, this will give us a ZC, where C is the target class, that we can interpret as how many standard deviations away the target class score OC is from the mean of the scores of all the classes. Okay. <clears throat> so presumably, if it's very high in rank, then it's going to be likely to, uh, to be further away from the mean to be further number of deviations away from the mean. Uh, right. So we use a soft margin loss. The second thing is a soft margin loss to encourage large ZC. Okay, so basically this is a soft loss that we do here. We have our ZC, and what we want to do is, if ZC is quite large, well, we're not going to insist much, and if it's below a given threshold, uh, then we're going to uh, increase the rate. Basically, here it's going to receive gradient, and as it's bigger and large, it's going to receive less gradients. Okay, so the the margin would a, a true margin, soft margin would be uh, like this, like a hinge loss type of thing. Here it's a soft loss, so it's kind of a soft version of this. Um, so there's a number of interesting properties of this loss. Uh, first, it's part of the spherical family by design. Uh, which means that its, its gradient is updated in O of small d squared rather than O of big D small d, which is our goal. Uh, second, it's shift invariant, like the softmax, which means that if you add a constant to uh, all your O's, okay, it won't change the Z's. It's also scale invariant, which means that if you multiply, if you scale all your outputs, it won't change the Z. And that's unlike the softmax. So the softmax will have an effect of, of, of the scaling here. Um, but they do not sum to one, so they're not probabilities. So we cannot compute perplexity, for instance. It's essentially a different kind of normalization. We have the norm, the Euclidean normal to Z, so that's one. Okay. So here are uh, some uh, results that we did with this, uh, with this and the other, other losses that we uh, presented. On uh, Pentry Bank, which has 10,000 words, so 10,000 classes as target classes, uh, on a simple um, MLP language model with six words uh, context. And uh, we can look at the top one uh, error rate, top five error rate, top 10 error rate, et cetera, and the mean reciprocal rank, mean average precision. Um, basically, the mean squared error with zero one was the worst, uh, followed by the Taylor softmax. Uh, we also tried the cross entropy with sigmoid, which had uh, lowest top one error, surprisingly outperformed softmax on this task. And our Z loss uh, achieved the lowest top 5, 10, 20, 50, and 100 error. Okay. You can look here, you can see here, um, for example, if you get to top, top 100, okay. and uh, the Z loss is just here, the lowest. Um, so high probabilities A and B were tuned individually for each of these top K. And here is why. We have introduced a loss which has hyperparameters in it, A and B, okay, uh, which basically say where to put this curve and how strong its slope is going to be. And this allows it to tune these hyperparameters for to, bet, to best match the, the, the task loss of interest. So if if our task, uh, our application would really be, could you really use top 10, a good top 10 precision, then we can tune our A and B hyperparameters to reach the better top 10 precision. And that's what we did. And we see that uh, they can actually be quite sensitive. So um, it's not the same value, same type of value for A that yields the best top 10 as the one that yields the best top one, for instance. So uh, next, we tried on the largest uh, task we could uh, find, which is a one billion word uh, corpus, which has a vocabulary size of 707, well, close to 800,000 classes. Uh, and we used a neural language model that's essentially identical to the one that was uh, proposed uh, by Chen Grandji and uh, Oli um, to compare large models. Um, um, here's, here's the architecture of the model. And 
here, if you look at the timings that we get, with the softmax <coughs> for one epoch, which corresponds, what we call an epoch here, corresponds to visiting 150 million n-grams, okay, um, the softmax on CPU the, would take 78 days, okay, for one such epoch. And among those 78 days, there's 69 days for computing the output. So the rest of the network is really negligible. On CPUs, it's only four days. Um, <clears throat> okay. The hierarchical soft, so for comparison, we compare with the hierarchical softmax, which is a very different approach. Uh, it's about 12 hours, 10 hours. And our Z loss with this factorized technique uh, is two hours or one hour in on the G <coughs> for the output only on the GPU version. Uh, and now if we look at the error rates that we get, uh, again, we cannot compute perplexity with our, our Z loss, but we can compute the top one, the top 20 error rate. Uh, well, <coughs> with that net one model, basically we reached a top one error rate of 72.13%, which is a little worse than the hierarchical softmax, okay? but quite close still, uh, and at about one-fourth of the time. Okay, it took four days for the hardcore softmax, one day for our approach. Um, and for the top 20 error rate, <coughs> also uh, we're a little worse. Now with the larger, slightly larger model, okay, which trained in 3.14 days, uh, we were be able to outperform the hierarchical softmax on the top one error rate. So, to conclude, uh, basically we developed an algorithm that works for very large output layers and sparse targets, and we can train them in time independent of the size of uh, the output layer, of the, the size of the vocabulary in case of uh, language models and the number of classes. Um, the limitation is that it works for a very restricted family of loss functions, and I insist that it is very restricted, the spherical loss family receives only summary statistics on all outputs O. Okay. Basically, it's just the sum and the sum of squares, which you can view as just the mean and the variance. And basically, it summarizes the scores for all the classes, but the target class, by just these two numbers. And we do away with that. And despite the simplicity and this limitation, the Z-loss yields surprising good tip K result when it's hyperparameter is tuned properly. Uh, now, one thing that I want to, that I need to point out that I haven't mentioned yet is that there is a little practical limitation. Uh, in theory, the, <coughs> the, um, the uh, computation time is really all small d squared, okay? But in practice, uh, there are some numerical stability issue. So we need to do some numerical stabilization when our matrix U becomes ill-conditioned, okay? And uh, this is an O of big D times small d operation, so it reintroduces a dependency on big D. Okay, so we can't claim that in practice we're totally independent of big D. But uh, what we noticed that is that this numerical stabilization, uh, we, we, we didn't need to do it that frequently. So we can do many updates before it's required. It depends on the problem, obviously. Um, and the timings incorporated that. Okay, um, as future work, we would like to try to apply that to different problems, uh, maybe for recommended systems to adapt the approach, uh, maybe it would be appropriate for that. Uh, and uh, another research direction is to allow each class to be represented by a feature vector that is different space than W, and which would introduce a, a structure of weight sharing in W to address the different problems. Thank you. Just a small question, why did, did you try word accuracy as a measure? Because in speech recognition, we don't care about the perplexity of the language model. All we care about is the word accuracy. Is the, the word accuracy? 
Yes, basically perplexity actually is not even a good predict predictor of word accuracy in speech recognition. But you're talking about the word accuracy in a speech rec in a yes, full speech it has recognition to be a speech system. recognizer, yes. Yes, uh, yes. so uh, we didn't try, I mean, yeah. the only experiments we run were, were in language models because we didn't have a whole speech recognizer. Maybe, maybe yeah. I have a secondary question. Would it be possible to, to, to do like most of the epochs with Z loss and only the one last epoch with the so, softmax? So, so we tried to do that, to pre-train with a Z loss and fine-tune with a softmax. We haven't had much success with it so far, um, because probably because the two kinds of losses are quite different. So, thank you. Another question. Okay, so let's thank the speaker.